and gentlemen. Thank you for joining and welcome to this webinar entitled Communities of Ocean Action, Sustainable Blue Economy. My name is Alexander Trepelkov. I am officer in charge of the Division for Sustainable Development Goals at the United Nations Department of Economic and Social Affairs, UNDESA. UNDESA serves as the substantive secretariat uh, for the first UN uh, Ocean Conference held at uh, UN headquarters in 2017, and since then has been managing online registry of voluntary commitments on ocean action. This registry uh, was one of the key outcomes of the 2017 Ocean Conference which rallied all stakeholders to act for the ocean. Today, uh, there are over 1,600 voluntary commitments registered by governments, private sectors, NGOs, and academia from around the world, among which 420 are under community of ocean action on sustainable blue economy. During this webinar, we will hear from representatives of VC holders who will present on the implementation of their respective commitments and share best practices during a panel discussion, which I have the honor to moderate. But first, it is my pleasure to invite you to watch a video message from Mr. Liu Zhenmin under Secretary General for Economic and Social Affairs and co-focal point of the COA on Sustainable Blue Economy. Please play the video. Distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, I'm pleased to welcome you to today's important webinar. I command all of you for your contribution and the stewardship of the community of ocean action on sustainable blue economy, as well as your long-standing commitment to the implementation of SDG 14. There's no doubt that ocean is integral to the survival of our planet. Not only does it act as a crucial buffer to temperature change and a giant sink for greenhouse gas emissions, ocean provides us with food, oxygen, and supports the great diversity of life and ecosystems. Interest in the economic potential of ocean is also escalated. Three billion people rely on ocean for their livelihood. Goods and services from ocean generates about 2.5 trillion US dollars each year, and they contributed over 31 million direct full time jobs before the sudden onset of the COVID 19 pandemic. The ocean is seen as the next great economic frontier, with the numerous ocean based industries growing by many orders of magnitude in the recent past and in the near future. Small-scale fisheries account for more than half of total production on average. Aquaculture production currently provides half of the global fish supply. In these developed countries, 76% of value added from ocean-based industries comes from marine fisheries. Distinguished participants, a sustainable blue economy goes beyond transportation, fisheries, and other material goods garnered from ocean. Immense economic potential also lies in emerging ocean sectors, including low carbon shipping, off 
of your renewable energy, marine biotechnology, and ecotourism, just to name a few. Moreover, the post pandemic era requires a better recovery that is robust, sustainable, resilient, and inclusive. And the ocean holds the key to bringing prosperity and sustainability together. A sustainable blue economy offers solutions to bring economic benefits by creating jobs while safeguarding marine ecosystems and protecting the ocean. It can help direct economic recovery packages towards ocean-based industries to deliver near-term economic and social benefits. And it can help steer efforts away from undermining ocean health and the marine ecosystem. Dear colleagues, in recent years, we have seen growing interest among policymakers and stakeholders in developing sustainable blue economies. Numerous voluntary commitments under the Ocean Conference of Life Chain, which UNDESA is managing, directly contribute or refer to sustainable blue economy. As I mentioned, at the high level thematic debate on ocean and SG14 held on June 1st, the voluntary commitments registered by governments, private sectors, NGOs, and major groups since the 2017 Euro Ocean Conference was a groundbreaking practice in providing a means for everyone to do their part to achieve SDG 14. Voluntary commitments are vital to generate innovative solutions, pool resources from different sectors, and transfer commitments to concrete ocean actions. To fully implement it and properly monitor and scale up, they can make a real difference. That is why we need internal collaboration and communication within our community of ocean action. We can share best practices and experiences, brainstorm innovative solutions, and explore opportunities of further collaboration to ensure we are on the right track to achieve the deliverables. You and Tessa will continue to maintain the registry and support the voluntary commitment holders of our community of ocean action to jointly pursue sustainable blue economy to a healthier and a vibrant ocean. I wish you a fruitful discussion today. I thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, as Under Secretary General Liu Jinmin just stressed in his remarks, the post pandemic era requires an economic recovery that is robust, sustainable, resilient, and inclusive. And the ocean holds a key to bringing prosperity, sustainability, and equity all together. A sustainable blue economy offers viable solutions to generate economic and social benefits by creating jobs and incomes while safeguarding marine ecosystems and protecting the ocean. It has therefore been at the forefront of many countries' strategies to implement SDG 14. UNDESA has worked with Dr. Margio Vieras, Director of Coastal Policy and Humanities Research, on producing a publication entitled Promotion and Strengthening of Sustainable Ocean-Based Economy. This publication, which we are launching today, examines conditions and safeguards that make ocean-based economies sustainable, highlighting uh, case studies and lessons learned in order to provide guidance that can help countries transform from theory to practice. In this regard, I would also like to thank the government of Sweden for its generous contribution, which made the production of this report possible. For the presentation of this publication, 
I am now pleased to invite the author, Dr. Maggio Vieras, Director of Coastal Policy and Humanities Research, to deliver her keynote address on promotion and strengthening of sustainable ocean-based economy. Dr. Vieras, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Trebolkov. Colleagues, let me see if I can get the uh, technology going over here. There we go. Um, and thank you very much for this uh, opportunity to share with you some of the uh, findings from this uh, new report on promotion and strengthening of sustainable ocean-based economies. And I just wanted to start with a short introduction to uh, talk about the increasing focus on the economic potential of the ocean. And in fact, uh, before COVID, uh, it was estimated that the ocean uh, uh, a contribution to the global economy could double from 1.5 trillion in 2010 to 3 tr trillion in 2030, uh, although these estimates will need to be revised in light of COVID-19. Now, the blue economy concept, which is now becoming increasingly popular, originated from the uh, 2012 UN Conference on Sustainable Development, the Rio Plus 20 Conference. And uh, when you look at the uh, uh, discussions around this concept, there's different terminology that's being used, sustainable ocean-based economy, blue economy, blue growth ocean economy, just to name a few. But in general, blue economy or sustainable ocean-based economy has come to mean growth of ocean-based economic development in a manner that is both environmentally sustainable and socially equitable. But having said that, there really is not a commonly accepted definition at this moment. But uh, blue economies or sustainable ocean-based economies have become an important strategy for countries to implement SDG 14. And I'll say a little bit more about that in a bit. But first, I just wanted to uh, share this graphic, which I borrowed from the uh, World Bank to highlight the components of the uh, blue economy, uh, which is usually thought to be composed of different ocean sectors and what those sectors are varies by, by country. Uh, this displays some of them, some of the more established sectors like fisheries, tourism, and marine, maritime transport, and some of the newer uh, sectors, for example, renewable uh, ocean energy. But also not to forget about uh, oceans as providers of goods and services, and uh, for example, oceans are carbon sinks and all the work going on around uh, blue carbon. But there is one thing that everybody agrees on, which is that blue economy should not be business as usual, but it should be something that is better, that is more transformative going forward, more sustainable. There is certainly a lot of discourse around this concept, and I'm just showing a couple of the uh, reports and publications that have recently come up on this topic. There's many more than uh, what I'm showing here. Uh, reports by agencies, but also interestingly, uh, um, publications in high profile journals like Nature as well. So there certainly is a lot of discussion around what the blue economy is and uh, how it is being implemented. There's also an increasing number of blue economy conferences that provide a valuable opportunity to share experiences and discuss this concept further. And just to highlight the first one here, the first global sustainable blue economy conference that was hosted uh, uh, in Kenya and um, uh, that provided really the first platform for a global discussion on this topic. And then there are a lot of other ones as well, both regional and, uh, and global. So let me then uh, get on to Sustainable Development Goal 14 and Blue Economy as a, as a strategy towards attaining SDG 14. And there certainly seems to be growing national interest in Blue Economy development. If you look at the voluntary commitments, uh, uh, there's a number of examples of both national and regional developments and uh, Seychelles, Grenada, Grenada, Mauritius, EU, Kenya, and many other countries, just to name a few, uh, are exploring actively uh, transitions to a blue economy. 
And in fact, there are over 80 voluntary commitments that directly refer to developments related to blue economy or blue growth. And if you then start looking at uh, all of the various sectors, uh, there's more than 330 voluntary commitments that would relate to uh, some aspect or another of the sustainable ocean-based economic development. In fact, probably many, many more if you really look at everything. Uh, the terms blue economy, blue growth, ocean economy, uh, and sustainable ocean economy are all used in the uh, voluntary commitments. But some of the common features that we see is the involvement of multiple ocean sectors, and also often the inclusion of uh, marine spatial planning as sort of the governance uh, organizing framework, and as well as marine protection activities. So uh, just to look at the entities that are making um, uh, various voluntary commitments that uh, refer to blue economy, blue growth, ocean economy, uh, that's the different colored bars that you see, blue economy being the uh, darkest blue there. And uh, most of the commitments are made by governments, but also there's a substantial number by NGOs and by private sector, intergovernmental organizations, UN entities, and a number of other uh, entities as well. Um, generally, uh, these commitments include multiple sectors of ocean economy, uh, and if you look at the individual sectors involved, the most common is sustainable fisheries, followed by aquaculture, maritime transport, and seabed minerals. Climate resilience, including blue carbon, is also well represented in the commitments. And their commitments that seek to enhance the capacity, technology, innovation, and science that support a blue economy. There's been a little bit less focus on things like marine biotechnology, uh, tourism, and renewable ocean uh, energy. And uh, this graph uh, demonstrates what I just mentioned. Uh, uh, most common, uh, common commitments uh, have multiple sectors involved. But on your left uh, top uh, section there, uh, you can also see some of the enabling activities that include things like capacity building, science, financing. And then on the right, there are some of the individual sectors of which fisheries uh, is the largest, but also marine protection and management as well as restoration uh, feature quite heavily in these commitments. I wanted to just take a moment to talk about uh, the issue around the definition or how do we understand blue economy? And there's a number of terms that are being used, blue economy, blue growth, sustainable ocean-based uh, economy. But uh, these terms continue to be used in slightly different ways by different countries and different organizations, uh, with blue economy being now quite the popular term. But there's still ambiguity about what it actually means. And in fact, uh, there was a study that looked at 14 different countries, each of which used 14 different definitions for blue economy. So looking at these definitions, what you usually see is a focus on triple bottom line of objectives of environmental sustainability, economic growth, and social equity. And all of this driven by integrated ocean governance and technological innovation. Uh, probably one of the more representative ones is this one from the World Bank and United Nations, uh, which states that blue economy seeks to promote economic growth, social inclusion, and the preservation and improvement of livelihoods, while at the same time ensuring environmental sustainability of the oceans and coastal areas. So the definition essentially seeks to decouple social and economic development from environmental degradation. And as I mentioned before, there is an agreement that blue economy needs to go beyond business as usual to be transformative. So is it a problem then that we don't have a commonly accepted definition? And certainly I could think of a number of policy concepts that are not well defined or have competing definitions. One that comes to mind is, for example, the ecosystem approach. And these uh, approaches are still, and concepts are still being implemented on the ground. But what is a little bit concerning is that uh, with blue economy uh, increasingly important uh, in the SDGs, it should be, a, uh, it seems to me that it would be a good idea to have at least a common understanding about what it means. And also to ensure that uh, the practices under the blue economy are not sustainable, either envi environmentally or socially. 
So one way forward, uh, which is uh, what was done with the uh, ecosystem approach, for example, is to try to develop principles or guidance. And there are, in fact, already existing ones by WWF, IUC, and then others. And also learning by doing collection and analysis of case studies. And here is this is where the conference is. Uh, for example, the Blue Economy Conference and the Communities of Ocean Action are really providing a valuable service in, in uh, learning uh, from how these uh, things work in practice. But this has been mentioned that something perhaps the United Nations could tackle. Now, uh, shifting gears a little bit, then I just uh, want to delve a little bit deeper in the report into what we have learned thus far on, uh, from the blue economy. What are the challenges to blue economy development? And what are also some of the lessons that have been learned from the early experiences? Starting from the challenges, uh, primarily one of the challenges that most, uh, a very large number of voluntary commitments have mentioned is financing and affordable financing at scale is needed, yet it is very difficult to access and has become a major obstacle for many countries. And this is not getting any better with COVID-19. In fact, COVID-19 has complicated access to financing with competing priorities for financing elsewhere. Capacity and technology also becomes a challenge and blue economy has uh, requirements for capacity and technology innovation. It is based on technologies, cleaner and renewable technologies, bio-based technologies and sustainability innovations and a skilled workforce as well to um, um, operate those new technologies. So this remains a challenge. Uh, enabling conditions and coordination these status refers to things like institutional capacity, regulatory governance, legislation, human resources capacity. And particularly because we're talking about multiple sectors in an ocean economy, blue economy, the coordination between sectors and transboundary coordination as well. Stakeholder engagement, uh, a number of uh, voluntary commitments mentioned that as an issue. And political will and leadership is something that can certainly drive uh, blue economies forward um, when present. Um, equity, uh, often in many reports, has been called the uh, forgotten dimension of blue economy. And this is really uh, quite difficult. How do we actually provide for the inclusion in a blue economy of uh, local coastal communities, marginalized groups, and ensure that they uh, equitably share in the benefits of economic development. And this is very much in keeping with Agenda 2030 and its message of leaving no one behind. Addressing environmental concerns, uh, there are several challenges that exist there, uh, starting with making existing sectors more environmentally sustainable, but also ensuring that new sectors do not cause further environmental degradation. And because there are multiple sectors out there, again, trying to understand the combined and cumulative impacts of multiple sectors remains a challenge and providing for adequate marine protection within a blue economy. And finally, I also wanted to meet, I mentioned science needs and science and innovation being a key for driving a sustainable blue economy. And in fact, what we need is interdisciplinary, transdisciplinary ocean science that encompasses the environmental and social aspects of science, but also traditional knowledge. Now we are starting to learn from uh, early experiences and a lot of the voluntary commitments have provided important input on uh, blue economies. And uh, one of the key messages that seems to be coming out is that sustainable blue economies are dependent on good governance. Both and that uh, good governance is what enables the economic, environmental, and social benefits to uh, accrue from blue economies. And the national examples demonstrate the need for multi stakeholder governing framework. Often, this is marine spatial planning with a high level of stakeholder engagement and communication. There's also within that attention to representation and power dynamics that uh, needs to be paid and that uh, notes, notes have been made about that within the voluntary commitments. Livelihoods, community food security, those are all important aspects, as well as incorporation of marine protection. There is still room, it seems, uh, to diversify sectoral representation in blue economies 
to include sustainable new sectors. And uh, particularly here, I mentioned marine biotechnology and renewable ocean energy, but there's also many, many others as well that could come in there. There are some early examples that are very good for, about financing blue economy uh, transitions, and in fact, also principles that have been developed uh, on blue economy finance by the EC, WWF, WRI, and the European Investment Bank, which are quite helpful. Uh, as well as innovative financing examples on the ground, and Seychelles has pioneered some of these approaches on uh, blue bonds and debts, uh, debt for conservation swaps. And finally, making sure that the best available science is there, and there are efforts out there to make science openly available and accessible to uh, uh, those working in management and policy. Um, ocean observations, monitoring to better understand ecosystem change, whereas social science will give us a better understanding of ocean users, their roles and their aspirations. Uh, some examples incorporate traditional knowledge with full participation of knowledge holders. And I just wanted to note here the UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development, which really has the potential to improve available science and science capacity. Now, my last slide here, I just wanted to offer uh, some conclusions and final thoughts, and in fact, some questions as well for discussion. And um, one of the things that the report highlights really clearly is the importance of multi-sectoral governance that in integrates uh, sustainable human uses, environmental conservation, and social equity. And the social equity has been a, a difficult question up to now. So how do we ensure that benefits from a blue economy are broadly shared and that no one is left behind? And how do we best integrate conservation and equity in marine spatial planning? The report also highlighted the lack of commonly accepted definition of and guidance on the blue economy. And uh, as a question then, do we need a definition and or guidance? And if so, who should develop it? And finally, and quite importantly, the report pointed out the need for finance, capacity and technology for blue economy transitions. So is there a way to scale up the existing sustainable financing examples and provide more sustainable long-term finance for these initiatives? And also, how do we provide incentives for that technology transfer to ensure that all countries have that important technology available that will enable their sustainable blue economies? So I'll just leave it there and say thank you very much. We thank uh, Dr. Vieras for her informative and insightful presentation, which lays uh, a solid, substantive, and analytical foundation for our deliberations. We have now come to the next part of today's event, panel discussion, uh, during which uh, we will hear presentations by five distinguished panelists and I would ask them to try to stay within uh, seven, minute, uh, seven minutes each. Uh, but before giving them the floor, um, I wish to indicate that as voluntary commitment holders, our panelists uh, will uh, provide an update on the implementation of their respective voluntary commitments uh, with a view to taking stock of progress and then identifying gaps and challenges, sharing best practices and lessons learned. They will also explore how sustainable blue economy can help provide a viable response to the COVID-19 pandemic through blue-green recovery. We look forward to hearing their thoughts and insights on how sustainable blue economy and blue-green recovery actions can be aligned to and contribute to global initiatives and forthcoming events, such as the UN SDG Action Decade, UN Decade for Ocean Science, and the UN Decade for Ecosystem Restoration, as well as CBD COP15 and UNF, Triple C COP26. 
The panel discussion will be followed by a question and answers uh, segment. Without further ado, uh, I am pleased to introduce our first panelist, Ms. Uh, Marie Borel McKinnon, Senior Policy Officer and Special Assistant to the Secretary General of the International Seabed Authority. She will present on ISA's voluntary commitment, the Abisal Initiative. Ms. Burrell McKinnon, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So, first of all, allow me on behalf of the Secretary General of the International Civil Authority, His Excellency Mr. Michael Lodge, to express our gratitude to the organizers for inviting us to participate in this important webinar. As we reflect on the progress achieved in the implementation of the voluntary commitments registered at the 2017 UN Ocean Conference, sharing lessons learned in our respective efforts present a critical opportunity for us collectively to be able to identify the elements needed to create a sustainable blue economy where ocean protection, production and prosperity go hand in hand and ultimately serve the interests of all. Next slide, please. Our focus today will be on one of the seven voluntary commitments of ISA. This one was registered in partnership with UNDESA. Since then, this voluntary commitment has been operationalized in a project called the Abyssal Initiative for Blue Growth. It has received the support of the government of Norway and is implemented in close cooperation with Pacific Island states, particularly the four current sponsoring states, which are the Cook Islands, Kiribati, Nauru and Tonga. The main goal of this project is to provide the necessary support and technical assistance to these countries with a view to bridging the capacity gaps in the implementation of the 2030 agenda and particularly in relation to SDG 14. More information will now be shared in the form of a video presenting the main features and achievement of the Abyssal Initiative project. After the video, I will briefly come back and provide some further insights on the way forward. I will then now ask my colleague in UNDESA to play the video. Thank you. As large ocean states, the Pacific Small Island Developing States, or Pacific SIDS, rely heavily on the sustainable use of the ocean and its resources. For this reason, Pacific SIDS have been at the forefront of the development of the concept of blue economy, through which Pacific leaders are committed to harness the opportunities provided by the ocean. It is within this context that several Pacific states have been weighing the potential of deep sea mineral exploration and exploitation to support national and regional development priorities. Among them, four Pacific SIDS have decided to engage in exploration activities in the International Seabed Area, also known as the area. The Cook Islands, Kiribati, Nauru and Tonga are each sponsoring one exploration contract for polymetallic nodules in the Clarion Clipperton zone in the Pacific Ocean. Over the past 10 years, these four countries have been working on the development of sound national regulatory frameworks for deep seabed activities, as well as for the strengthening of their institutional capacity to comply with stringent international requirements. The Abyssal Initiative for Blue Growth, implemented by the International Seabed Authority in partnership with the United Nations Department of Economic and Social Affairs and the Norwegian Agency for Development Cooperation, was designed to support them in this effort. In particular, this project aims to enhance national expertise and scientific knowledge to inform and support decision making processes and the sound and effective implementation of legal requirements and monitoring measures. 
The first regional workshop organized under the project took place in Tonga in 2019, involving representatives from nine different Pacific Island states and representatives from international and regional organizations, civil society, and non-governmental organizations, the private sector, as well as members of the Legal and Technical Commission of ISA. The workshop identified critical capacity building needs for enabling Pacific SIDS to sponsor activities in the area. These needs are being addressed through a series of workshops covering the following topics. The obligations and responsibilities of sponsoring states under international law, marine scientific research, and accessing the results of such research, environmental management and monitoring of exploration activities in the area, Benefit sharing. The first category of needs was addressed during a workshop organized in Nauru, and the second category was addressed during workshop organized in Kiribati in 2019. The Abyssal Initiative for Blue Growth contributes towards the joint voluntary commitment registered by ISA and UN DESA at the 2017 UN Ocean Conference. It will support the promotion of blue economy principles and enable Pacific SIDS to fully benefit from the sustainable development of deep sea mineral resources in support of national and regional development goals. Thank you. And uh, now, uh, thank you so to my colleague, uh, Yuan Desa, because we had a little bit some technical challenge, but everything went well. That's very good. If we can come back to the, the PowerPoint very briefly, uh, just for me to conclude. Uh, to sum up, uh, since we implemented this project, uh, we can say that it has been quite successful because of the core guiding principle around which it is structured. And I think it also resonates very well with the presentation from uh, Mark Groh just before me. In fact, it is demand driven because it is based on the needs identified by the countries themselves. It places the emphasis on strategic partnership and strengthening cooperation at all levels. It follows an integrated approach, mixing governance and science. And very importantly, it involves all stakeholders. Next slide, please. And last slide. In conclusion, uh, I just would like to provide a way, uh, some information on the way forward. In a few days, we will convene in partnership with the Cook Islands, our fourth regional workshop, regretfully remotely, on the environmental management and monitoring of deep sea bed mining. Further, we have received informal requests from the specific sponsoring state participating to that project to expand the project beyond 2021 and DESA and ISA are currently working very hard to uh, work on the project framework. This is of particular importance since, as you may have heard, Nauru has officially informed the ISA Council of its intent to apply for a plan of work for exploitation within the next two years. If this certainly does not mean that deep sea bed mining can start in two years, it however indicates that we need together to increase our efforts to build the necessary capacities to ensure that countries can have the full ownership of this industry. I thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Ms. Burrell McKinnon for your very interesting multi-mode presentation. And thank you for mentioning my colleagues from UNDESA who have been working with the International Seabed Authority uh, on um, uh, this uh, Abyssal uh, initiative. Um, our second panelist uh, is Mr. Francis uh, Munieki uh, in his capacity as uh, a voluntary commitment holder on information technology in marine life for Kenya. Uh, Mr. Munieki, the floor is yours. If you could kindly unmute yourself, sir, so that we can hear you. Thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction. I want to share my slide. Um, I don't think I have rights yet. Uh, well, I get those right. So my name is Francis Munyaki. My company.
Dear colleagues, it seems that we are experiencing some technical differences, but I am sure that my colleagues will be able to help. Uh, so I think we can see the first slide now. Uh, so uh, I'm asking uh, Mr. Munieki to resume his uh, presentation. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Um, is that my slide or yours? It's on your side. So let's uh, move to the next slide. Now, MobiCard is a very uh, unique innovation. It's a tiny uh, ID sized identification card that we developed for fishermen and women in Lamu County in the country. Uh, it's an identification, verification, and authentication. Uh, ID card for fishermen and women. The reasoning for the Bobby card was about seven years ago, there was an um, increase of terror activities between Kenya and Somali, and that forced the country to shut down night fishing in the county of Lamu, which brought a lot of strife for the fishermen in that area. If you know Lamu, it's a large archipelago with about 20 to 30 islands, but a uh, largely spaced from each other in Lamu. And therefore, the fishermen couldn't go out fishing at night because, one, the security forces were out in forces. Secondly, they needed to keep identifying themselves day and night. Uh, next slide, please. Um, yeah, we can go to the next slide. So the biggest issue was that in order for them um, to go fishing, they had to go to the local administrator, fill in a paper form that would be able to identify the people who are in um, the boat to go and sail. And this brought the problem that it wasn't hard enough. The ID could get water, the paper could get water. And the only way to verify that the person doing the fishing is the person in the boat was to bring them back to shore to fully identify them. And so we were approached as a technology firm, and these were the questions that we were being asked from the different actors uh, who wanted to know what information they can be able to gather in order, one, to de-escalate uh, the situation, two, to allow uh, the local communities to be able to go about their businesses, third, to increase the level of trade because being a far flung area, they don't get very good prices for their products. And also whether this could go into the research area to be able to provide information on fishing, fishing activities, uh, the communities that would help both policymakers and administrators on how and what to do within uh, for the farm or for the fishermen in those areas. Uh, next slide, please. Like I was saying before the Mvubikad, this was the process that a fisherman would have to do to be able to go out to sea, to fish, hire a vessel, assemble a crew, uh, fill in a permit, a uh, physical paper with the local administrator, attach national ID, and then carry both the permit and the national IDs out to sea. Uh, paper, ID, seawater, that was not a good combination. And every time they would meet different aspects of the security forces, border patrol, uh, the army, the police, administration police, they had to keep producing and showing who they are to the satisfaction of the policemen. Uh, next slide. So we were approached and asked whether we could find a way where the fishermen, the security forces, the communities, the beach management units, the county livestock officer would be able to find and glean data that would be immediate and verifiable 
and would allow the fishermen to go about their business. And for that, we designed and developed the Mbubi Cut, which was uh, an innovative system that incorporated this very tiny ID card, which has a, a chip in it. Uh, had the RFID reader, which would probably be the size of a phone or slightly bigger, as you can see there. And then we took the photographs, the details, and the biometrics of all the fishermen and created the Mbubikad portal, such that the fishermen would only need to carry this ID, and the policemen would carry the uh, I Mbubikad reader, and anywhere that they would meet, they would immediately be able to read, identify, and verify whether the person carrying the Mbubi card is the Mbubi. And since we incorporated biometrics, it would also allow them to be able to verify on site using a fingerprint whether the person on the ID was also the person carrying the ID. Uh, next slide, please. And this is a brief illustration of uh, the ecosystem. A centralized cloud database, um, chip enabled uh, readers with information on and in the card and readers that we gave to both the administration officers, to the local fisheries, and to the BMU landing ports so that they would be able to read and add data that would all be incorporated in the central database. So the whole thing was a small footprint, easy to carry, waterproof uh, PVC card that would not be uh, easily lost or waterlogged uh, data on the card and in the card. The readers would be integrated with GSM technology and GPS so that where the interaction happened would be able to be recorded and uploaded with the data that goes into the database. So not only will we know who was fishing, but we'd also find out where they were fishing. And added onto this was additional capabilities that have not yet been incorporated, which is uh, putting in data on the types of fish uh, that were caught, the weights, the numbers, and the, I mean, and the quantities of fish that have been fished. So those are supposed to be phase two, whereby not only are we enabling the security aspect, now we're able to provide tradable trade information that would help the uh, fishermen market their products. Next slide. We launched in 2018 a pilot project, and this was part of what was called the Inuka project. Like I said at the beginning, security was an issue, and therefore the project was help, supposed to help uh, minimize the joblessness and radicalization of the youth and the security needs of the administration. So the main focus was security of the people and security of the borders and the areas. And these are the various uh, reports that came out from uh, uh, the initiators of the project that was Search for Common Ground. That was the review for 2018 pilot project. Uh, we have a review from the UNEP on how Mbubikad is an innovative idea. And therefore, there's are the launch and pictures from other events that we've participated to talk about Mbubikad. Next slide, please. So this is among the questions that we were supposed to ask, uh, whether it is important and successful and on track. So what we realized, and you would see from the reports there, is that there was a direct benefit to the communities with our innovative project, that the, the fishermen were benefiting directly from the innovation. And through that, they made it, uh, they wanted to use it in more sustainable. Also, the information gleaned from it helped in planning for both advocacy, policy, and research. Since the information is collected on a daily basis, the uh, sheer body of data that is being put in this database was going to be useful for everyone, depending on what their needs are with the data. And of course, it helped with uh, job security. If the fishermen can go fish, fish successfully, and if we could put the trade portal where they would be able to report on a daily basis how much fish they have to enable the fish traders to just move directly to the fishermen.
fly the fish instead of um, turning up and the people have not come back or coming a day late and the fish has spoiled because most of these fishing communities don't have uh, freezers as you I don't know whether you know but that's the reason so in terms of replication it's very simple to uh, set up collect the data and input it's very easy to produce this uh, with uh, an ID print an ID card printer and not only is it useful in the coastal areas we have um, the lakeshore areas in Kisumu and Lake Turkana, who also have fishermen and women requesting to be able to do the same. And if we want to implement in other areas, we don't have to change anything. We simply produce cards and add the information to the database. So it's very easy to replicate both at a local, county, country, and a regional level. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so this is what happened in the project. We produced uh, 700 cards. We had a formal launch with all the stakeholders. We created a local database for the beach management using units, and we collaborated and sensitized both the communities, both the local government and the national government in uh, the utilization of the Mbuvi card. However, as you can see, that was last week or two weeks ago, uh, we're suffering the dividends of peace. The initial issue with MovieCard was based on the security uh, deterioration in the area at that time. But over the last few years, we're in a largely peaceful uh, situation in the country, and the focus has uh, reduced on the MovieCard. And therefore, as you can see, uh, we had a complaint from the fishing community that after the pilot project, the rest of the, product, the rest of the IDs have not been uh, given to the community, but that really is uh, a factor of the organizations that were pushing for the Mbovicad. The whole issue was security and uh, uh, minimizing radicalization, and when that reduced, then we have suffered the consequences in the project. Uh, next. Next slide, please. on what this innovation can do to the sustainable blue economy. Um, it's very uh, simple, so to speak, to implement. And then the data that the data and data points that you can collect from Bovicad can increase depending on what it is that you want to learn. But the basic concept, which is the Bovicad, does not need to change. So the readers, as we would call them, can be able to collect different types and as much data as they would want, but the person carrying the ID, the fisherman, does not need to change his way of life. And if we change something in the future, the ID would still be usable now and in the future. So it is very uh, innovative science, and it can be used both on a global and national level, and it, can, uh, it does not need to be changed in the future should the requirements of data be, be changed or should the person wanting the data be different from what was originally conceived. And therefore, we hope uh, should this pro project continue that we we'll pre create an e-trade platform where we'd be able to trade the fish directly using mobile payment platform and an e-commerce platform so that the, both the people who want the fish and the people doing the fishing can be able to meet through our e-trade platform. Next slide, please. Uh, in conclusion, um, MovieCard was mooted as a security tool, but it is multidimensional, scalable, replicable, versatile, and self-sustaining. It is more useful to science-based initiatives uh, like science, research, policy, and advocacy, but most importantly, uh, it is a tool that is driven or pushed by the end user that is a fisherman. And that has been our experience. And as you can see, they're really looking for the Mbovicat to be implemented and rolled out to all of them as was originally pro proposed. I think that was our report.
Uh, I think Mr. Uh, uh, Muniaki, uh, 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 for his very interesting presentation, highlighting the importance of science, technology, and innovation uh, for promoting uh, sustainable blue economy, uh, and uh, providing an example uh, of uh, practical, innovative solution uh, to governance uh, and security uh, challenges. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Kirsty Nash of the University of Tasmania, uh, who will present uh, on their VC titled uh, Creating a Vision to Guide Development uh, of a Sustainable Ocean Future, Future Seas 2030 Initiative. Dr. Nash, you have the Thank you very much. I'm just waiting for permission to share content. Oh, here we go. I promise you will get it. So thank you very much for that introduction. Um, <clears throat> I, before I go into the details of our voluntary commitment, I wanted to take a second and have you all um, visualize and picture the future of the blue economy. Visualize what the future holds for society at large and what the future holds for you as individuals. And when you're um, taking that time to visualize, you might have pictured this or this or even this. But regardless of what your vision of the future looks like, the chances are you have a lot of uncertainty about what that future looks like and how it will play out. And that uncertainty can be linked to feelings of powerlessness about how we can direct the future. With all the challenges facing society today, this often, these, these feelings of powerlessness often lead to inaction. But if we're to create a vibrant blue economy that supports healthy people and healthy oceans, it's critical we get past powerlessness and we get past inaction and we take targeted action to create a desirable future and a desirable blue economy. So how can we do that? The process of developing scenarios, future scenarios, directly exploring future uncertainty can help us create a vision or narrative of the future that acts as a mobilising force that um, helps drive action. Scenarios focus on what the future could look like and these scenarios can then be used to explore how we might achieve that future, providing a way to direct action at individual, community, national and international level to help achieve the future. So a key component of this scenario development approach is this development of a shared vision of the future. And I'm fairly certain at the beginning when I asked you to picture the future that everyone pictured something slightly different. So our individual pictures, our individual visualizations are shaped by worldviews, our knowledge, our culture, background, and so on. And creating shared visions of the future leverages the powers, powerfulness of individuals and communities' experiences to develop a future that reduces inequalities and maximizes opportunities for different parts of society with, in relation to the blue economy. And this is the inspiration for our voluntary commitment, Future Seas. Future Seas is a project coordinated by the Centre for Marine Socioecology here in Tasmania in Australia, and it involves over 100 different researchers from 20 different nations. The project is all about creating shared visions for the world's oceans in relation to 12 grand challenges currently facing the oceans. So that's things like climate change adaptation and mitigation, ocean literacy and public engagement, climate driven species redistribution and sustainable ocean use. So for each of these 12 grand challenges, we have addressed two questions. What could the future look like in 2030? So that's at the end of the UN decade of ocean science for sustainable development. If we used existing scientific knowledge and technology to move towards a more desirable future. So what we've done is for each of those 12 grand challenges, we have explored a business as usual future. So where we're currently heading, the current trajectory and a more sustainable future, so one directly aligned with the sustainable development goals, what we could 
technically achieve if we used current knowledge and emerging technology? And the difference between these features is really um, around people's values, behaviours, choices, and so on. And I want to emphasise that the features we came up with weren't necessarily supposed to be predictions of the future. They're more about exploring plausible features that are informed by the evidence. And the second thing we looked at is how we could actually achieve this more sustainable future, because it's not enough to envision a desirable future. We also want to know how we can achieve that. And so we worked out action pathways. So what were the actions we could take over the course of the UN decade of ocean science to create these um, desirable features for 2030 in relation to the 12 grand challenges? And so those are actions that can be taken on the short term in the next few years, um, right up to the end of the, the ocean decade. So we have four main outcomes from our, our voluntary commitment. The first is these visions of and pathways to this more desirable future. And <clears throat> initially, these are being produced as a series of scientific publications that are going to be published in a special issue in the journal Reviews in Fish Biology and Fisheries that's going to be launched in September this year. And in addition to this scientific output, um, we've also produced graphical representations of all these futures and action pathways um, to help try and communicate these features to a broader audience. So as an example, this is the graphical representation in relation to um, the grand challenge, exploring feedbacks between ocean health and human health. And um, you can see this top circle here, this is our um, living and connecting. So this is our more sustainable future um, that we imagined in relation to feedback between ocean and human health. And then we suggested there were four main strategies or sets of actions that could achieve that science and health communication, knowledge exchange, incentives, rules and regulations. And obviously there's a lot more detail than that um, that I don't have time to go into just now. The second outcome has been all about interdisciplinary learning. So these are the key steps we took over the series of workshops over two years that has made up the project Future Seas. And you can see that a lot of the steps are about sharing knowledge and learning. So bringing people together from different disciplines and um, identifying what our different perspectives are, building trust, and really becoming aware of people's other people's perspectives. And then at the end of the project, we've had a whole session, uh, series of sessions around identifying what this interdisciplinary learning is and identifying common themes across the grand challenges. And just to emphasize the scale of this interdisciplinary learning, there are all the different disciplines that have been involved in the project. So both people from marine science, whether that's biology or physical science, but also people working in governance, law, economics, philosophy, psychology, and information technology. So it's been a really broad suite of, of researchers involved. In addition to learning across disciplines, we've also been working across multiple knowledge systems. So there's been a group of 12 indigenous and tradi traditional knowledge holders that have been involved in future seas, both contributing to some of the other grand challenges, but also working together um, on their own grand challenge focused on indigenous communities in relation to um, the oceans and the future of the oceans. Um, and these orange dots on the map show you where those indigenous and traditional knowledge holders um, have come from who are part of the Future Seas project. The third co outcome is training in relation to the next generation of ocean leaders. So of the over 100 researchers that were involved in this project, um, for over 40% are early career researchers. So these are the people that at the end of the UN decade of ocean science are going to be ocean leaders. And so very much a focus has been on building capacity and, and training those that next generation of, of ocean leaders. And of the scientific outputs, 13 of the uh, scientific papers produced as part of Future Seas have been led by these early career researchers. And then the final outcome has been focused on producing tools and, and practic practical toolkits to support ocean sustainability. So this is an example that came out of the um, grand challenge focused on ocean literacy and public engagement with the oceans. And it's a toolkit that explores best practice principles for ocean learning talks about how to design ocean literacy programs and also gives links and, and information on examples of successful programs. And, and if you're interested in that, um, this link here will take you to the to the ocean literacy toolkit. So I just wanted to finish um, to 
give you a sort of an, an overall summary of the future seas voluntary commitment is that it's been all about exploring the ocean we need for the future we want. And if you want to learn more and see any of the graphical representations or, or read any of the, the scientific research, if you go to futureseas2030.org, all the information is there. Thank you very much. I uh, thank Dr. Nash for her interesting presentation on the Future Seas uh, 2030 initiative. Uh, our fourth panelist uh, is Dr. Alasdair Harris, founder of Blue Ventures. He will present on the VC entitled Empowering Communities to Monitor and Manage their marine resources and uh, di uh, diversify local livelihoods. Dr. Harris, over to you, please. Thank you very much. Is it possible to have share access for my slides? Thank you very much. Nothing is impossible, but <laughs> sometimes it takes uh, a little while to achieve. You should be able to now. I see. think we're, we're getting there. Fantastic. Well, it's a great pleasure to be able to, to share with you today. I work for Blue Ventures. We're an organization that supports tropical coastal communities and small scale fishers to design, um, scale and strengthen locally led fisheries management and marine conservation at the very much at the community level. We work in around a dozen low income coastal states, predominantly in East Africa and the Western Indian Ocean and Southeast Asia. We believe very much in the power of traditional and small scale fishers to transform coastal conservation and, and fisheries management. And we really put them at the heart of, of everything that, that, that we do. Um, two commitments have been identified and recorded by by our organization that, that I'm going to share to, with you today um, under the theme of, of, of empowering communities to, to manage their their inshore tropical marine resources um, and specifically those th these two two commitments relate to scaling up the use of locally led fisheries management specifically around the use of what we call temporary fisheries closures to demonstrate that the fisheries and social and economic benefits of locally led fisheries management. We call it the community catalyst approach. And the second um, commitment is around the development of mangrove blue carbon conservation. So generating value from the avoided deforestation of these incredibly carbon rich blue forests. Now I'll cover each of these in turn. So the first of those was scaling up the use of, of those temporary fishery fishery closures as a catalyst for locally led fisheries management and conservation. And the de deliverable that we were working towards was to increase the global population that we're reaching within these target countries to 350,000 people. Um, but first, perhaps, what do we mean by the, these temporary fishery closures? Well, crucially, conservation and fisheries management urgently need needs means to overcome the perceived investment and the opportunity cost of set as, setting aside areas of ocean for recovery, for regeneration um, as protected areas. That economic sacrifice can often be too much for, for communities that are wholly reliant on fisheries for food and income to bear and can lead to the erosion and breakdown of, of, of conservation areas. We've tried to tackle this by grounding local management efforts in countries like Madagascar, East Timor, Indonesia, Tanzania, in the use of temporary fisheries closures to initially give communities an experience of management, grounding these fisheries closures in locally owned participatory data systems that give those communities and small scale fishers, women and men, access to the data in close to real time with which they can assess the efficacy um, and effectiveness of those local conservation efforts. Often they these fisheries closures target just one or two species initially, typically fast growing invertebrate fisheries that are very important for local economies. One of the biggest small scale fisheries, for example, in the island states of the Western Indian Ocean is for this day octopus, octopus cyanea, and this is sold from 
some of the remotest um, beaches and landing stations in Africa onto very long supply chains that will eventually connect these communities to markets in, for example, Europe or, or North America. So embarking on marine management, fisheries management with these closures has proven to be highly catalytic in unlocking um, and mobilizing communities to move towards more ambitious permanent marine protected areas here in the Comores, where fisher women's associations are using those locally owned data systems to understand how their fishery is performing. And then building on the back of these closures, working with fisher folk organizations, community organizations, NGOs and local CSOs to really strengthen that local governance um, on which marine management, equitable marine management is so reliant. We were delighted last year to see published for the first time compelling evidence of the recovery of fish stocks within those one of the first permanent marine reserves established on the back of these temporary closures um, in Madagascar. So real compelling evidence of the conservation benefits that can flow from using this fisheries closure as an entry point for, for marine management. Um, fisheries data that we've published have showed monthly internal rates of return from these closures that can exceed 90%. So what we're really beginning to discover is that these communities are able to, 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 to generate real meaningful economic returns from effective local management. In fact, returns that can beat almost any financial product on the market because of the inherent resilience and enormous productivity of tropical fisheries. So in line with our commitment, we've been working with partners across um, the tropical Indo-Pacific to share some of these experiences, primarily through local fisheries learning exchanges. And we've been able to do this virtually during the pandemic. And I'm very happy to say that we've managed to exceed our target. So we've gone beyond the 350,000 people that we hoped to support by the end of last year to 454,000 uh, people across 12 countries that are now being impacted directly by this management approach, which is being used again as a very much a foot in the door for much broader and more ambitious marine management efforts um, that are delivering meaningful benefits to both people um, and nature. I'm just going to move on to the next slide, which can show you some of the innovation behind this. So using participatory digitized data platforms that can return um, data to communities using indicators that are meaningful to them here, for example, the kilos of octopus caught per woman per unit time yield, in other words, um, to help them understand how effective those closures have been. And this is really about democratizing access to data in what has been uh, for a long time, perhaps the least digitized sector of the global food economy. And happily, many of these communities are also now embarking on those broader um, local marine management and protection efforts. Now, the second target that we we, we wanted to talk about was related to um, developing blue carbon and generating value from the avoided deforestation of, of these carbon rich mangrove forests. Uh, we've um, made considerable headway over the last few years in this regard, and we've been able to validate the, the what was for a period the world's largest um, blue carbon mangrove conservation project, according to the, the Plan Vivo standard. And we're now replicating this approach uh, for other sites in, in, in Madagascar and Southeast Asia. Now, protecting mangroves and restoring them, these critical blue carbon habitats is really a natural climate solution. It's, a, it's an affordable way to help avert dangerous climate breakdown, and it's available to us right now. Um, mangroves, as I hope everyone on the call knows, are being lost faster than almost any other forest type on Earth in coastal East Africa and the Western Indian Ocean. The primary drivers tend to be um, cutting for charcoal and agricultural conversion. Um, when we can work with communities to address that deforestation, to mitigate it through local management within these community run conservation areas, we can ensure that a lot of the carbon that would otherwise be oxidized and released as a result of degradation can be can be held, can be kept. And through innovation, for example, through new approaches to enabling communities to assess carbon stocks themselves, new tools that we've managed to develop that are enable putting the remote sensing data on deforestation rates in the hands of communities at a local level, we're really able to fast track 
the process of carbon project development. And so this project in, in, in Madagascar, the Tahiri Honku project, was taken to the market um, at the end of 2019 and validated against um, the Plan Vivo standard. And we've worked with the Plan Vivo standard for, 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 for it's a PES standard because it assures that at least 60% of the carbon revenue will go to community partners. We've managed to beat that at 73%, but this crucially prevents these initiatives from being commercial profit-making ventures. 24% um, of this project goes on to, to the government. And it's been a real case of working with communities in Madagascar to demonstrate and develop um, new approaches to carbon stock assessment within these intertidal forests. We've been in instrumental in helping shape some of the methodologies that are now helping guide um, the replication of carbon projects, marine carbon projects moving forward. Um, as we look ahead, have following verification of this first blue carbon project in, in Madagascar, we're working at four sites elsewhere through a very integrated approach that's blending um, the benefits that can flow to communities from carbon with those broader benefits and far more significant benefits that can flow to communities from improved fisheries management within the local mangroves that are being stewarded within those conservation areas with livelihood diversification initiatives, particularly through seaweed and sea cucumber aquaculture. And in some cases, such as Madagascar, integration of community health service provision. And of course, all of this is tied up within those strong local governance frameworks, which rely in the case of Madagascar on customary social codes like DINA. Um, the sites at which we're replicating are all more than 10 times the size of of the of that first carbon project in Madagascar that, that we've now validated. Um, that project was around 1400 hectares and is is generating around 1370 tons of uh, emissions reductions per year over the next 20 years. So we're seeing huge opportunity for replication of this approach through in the hands of communities in such a way that can ensure the equitable flow of those benefits to communities. There are some fundamental structural problems that remain within existing carbon project methodologies that really hinder the engagement of community initiatives. And there are also some fairly profound policy barriers, but we're exploring new ways to connect the growing um, volume of climate finance and carbon finance in particular to local mangrove stewardship more efficiently and more equitably to overcome some of these constraints. Um, I would end by adding that a lot of this work has been able to continue despite um, the interruptions of the pandemic. And that's because, of course, these communities have been able to stay in place and continue a lot of this work in the absence of the, 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 the frequent flyer history, perhaps, of, of, of the conservation sector. So I think some of the changes that we've seen in the democratization of, uh, of this work have been fairly profound um, and will help shape a more a leaner um, and lighter touch um, and lower carbon um, conservation sector moving forward. Um, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Harris, uh, for your presentation uh, on the impactful uh, initiative of empowering lo uh, local communities in the marine and coastal areas in an integrated way. Uh, our last panelist uh, is Dr. James Cairo, uh, Chief Scientist at the Kenya Marine and Fisheries Research Institute. Uh, who will speak on the follow-up uh, to the very successful Sustainable Blue Economy Conference held in Nairobi, uh, Kenya in November 2018, uh, as well as lessons learned uh, from um, the conference itself and uh, uh, initiatives uh, raised in the follow-up. Uh, Dr. Cairo, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Alexander. And uh, may I ask to, to be given the link to share? Uh, open. Is it working? Uh, uh, I'm looking for more option. Uh, switch. No, share option. Open system preferred. No. 
but I had uh, already a given, I had given a, a backup. Even if it doesn't work, I'll be able to use the view on your end. I can't see it. Either way, let's try to do it from our end if possible. Yes, uh, that will be okay. Share your slides, uh, then please put it up. Okay. All right, you can proceed, uh, Dr. Cairo. Sorry for that, that I could not control. Can you put it on the mode, the, the presentation mode, please? Yes. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is James Cairo, but I'll be speaking on behalf of my uh, uh, the Director General, James Njiru, and we are giving the country's perspective on what happened after the very successful Sustainable Blue Economy Conference that was held in Nairobi in 2018. Next slide, please. It's good to know the country's perspective, the country profile. We are a country in Africa with 47 million people. And the most important why I needed this slide was to show you the sea space. Our sea space is our EZ is 142,000, which is about 24% of the country area. But when you look at our marine fisheries, it's 9,000 tons only compared to the inland fisheries, that's the freshwater. And then you look at the potential. We have a high potential of marine fisheries but we are very low uh, capture now. So the question comes, where can we go from here? Next slide. So uh, where we can go is if we invest in the blue. So the blue, the ocean economy has become the buzzword. It's a new wave of economic development and it is the next pillar of the world economic order. And Kenya as a country, we didn't want to be left behind. Next slide. But when we are doing that, it has already been defined. We have to do it sustainably, and we have to look at it broadly. As WWF defines here, a sustainable ocean economy emerges when economic activity is in balance with the long-term capacity of ocean ecosystem to support this activity and remain resilient and uh, healthy. So we have to look at the health of the system as much as we want to exploit from the system. And that is the old message of the sustainable blue economy. Next slide. Here are uh, the country in 2018 held the first ever the sustainable blue economy conference. The conference had seven head of state, eight four ministers, governors and mayor, and it was held uh, in participation of the, the uh, Canada, Japan, and Kenya. They were the co-hosts. Next slide. During this conference, and many have, uh, uh, the, my previous speakers have, have already talked about, there was voluntary commitment of up to $172 billion. And this was in various sectors of the blue economy. So what I'll be presenting, I'll be presenting more of what has happened to Kenya specific uh, voluntary commitments. Next slide. And what our president, uh, from the uh, head of the state, from his own statement, it is clear that the ocean economy is a smart investment that can deliver social, economic and environmental benefit to our people. I commit myself and my government to achieving 100% sustainable ocean management of areas within our national jurisdiction guided by sustainable ocean plans. You can see our, how, how uh, commitment to sustainable blue economy has been at the highest level in the land. Next slide. This was the commitments made. The Kenyan major commitment were sustainable uh, exploitation of marine and water resources and water resources, I'm both talking about the freshwater and marine water, because remember the blue economy when it came, 
it so far focused so much on the ocean until people thought that the countries that are landlocked and they have waters and liver that were not included. So the brew economy in the country's context uh, deals with the both sector. So our commitment as a country is to have sustainable exploitation of marine and water resources, and also to control plastic and waste management, marine and safety, sustainable fisheries development, establishment of brew economy bank, and infrastructure development and technical assistance. Next slide. So how far have we done? How much have we done in sustainable transition of ocean resources? Because as much as I'll be talking today, I'll be more focusing on uh, SDG 14 on the ocean-based economy. So our scorecard as a country, we have by now trained more than 1,000 fishermen on sustainable fishing. And also we have trained the seafarers. We have upgraded the Kenya Maritime School, which is based in our Mombasa Bandari College. There are already construction of the fisheries company, what we call the Watoni Fishery Complex, whereby the 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 the, the, the fishers will all bring their, their catch before trading. Then there is a construction of suspension bridge. That is an infrastructure development. The country has already launched the Kenya Coast Guard service for protecting our marine affairs. And we have launched the Lamu port, which is a major undertaking by the government. And that will open the Northern frontier and link, and it will link Kenya, Ethiopia, Sudan. And more important, when it comes to marine health, we have uh, Kenya's implemented policy aimed at tackling the challenges of ocean pollution and particularly banning the one use of marine uh, plastic. And already we have a national brew economy committee within the state department of uh, fisheries and aquaculture which is overseeing uh, playing an oversight role on implementation of the uh, brew carbon uh, brew economy activity next slide please and this is in picture you can see the floating bridge which is already working there's the lambo port we have already opened the first bath we have cage culture, we have seaweed farming, we have the fish, the, the Watoni fisheries complex already operational, and of course the coast, the coast guard there where the, the president was uh, inaugurating. Next slide. But another thing that has moved forward, after the Sustainable Brew Economy Conference, Kenya joined other countries, 14 other member states, informing what we hope call the high level panel on nation economy. And this high level, uh, uh, the, sustainable, the, the high level panel on nation economy have their own uh, uh, highlights. Next slide. The highlights of the, the high level panel on nation economy is, is in this, in, it is investment in nature based climate solution, harnessing ocean based renewable energy. Decarbonizing ocean industry, sustainable, securing sustainable food for the future, deployment of carbon capture storage, and expanding ocean observation and research. What I've highlighted here is what Kenya has already started, uh, particularly in the nature based climate solution. We've moved further and incorporated marine climate actions in the uh, National Determined Contribution of Paris Agreement. In the securing food for the future, that's how we have done more of cage farming, marine uh, the, the protecting and safeguarding our fisheries, and of course, expanding our MCS, that is marine surveillance for the fisheries. Next slide, please. And in the new projects that have just uh, started, we have the Kenya Fisheries and Social Economic Development Project, KEMFED. This is a World Bank funded project that will over, over, over 100 million US dollar that will support the building of a sustainable marine fishery sector. Because you have, the other speakers have said, fisheries still remain the major actor in, uh, in the brew economy because it reaches on economy and food security. Then we have a new project, Go Brew Initiative. This is an EU project 
uh, of 25 million, but it's more focused on protecting coastal ecosystems while creating environmental friendly jobs. But what has happened, uh, the many, many steps have stalled because of COVID and my other speakers have said, if we look at the sectors that have been really, really much affected, is fisheries, of course, uh, tourism, and the marine transport sector. And overall, when we look at the fisheries, for instance, we are losing, when you look at the tourism, we have lost, as a country, we have lost more than 55 billion, uh, billion in terms of, in Kenya shillings, in terms of job losses. And we have also lost huge portion because most of our tourism end up at the coast. And in marine transport, there has been a really big drop in the volume of transported goods, this disruption due to the rerouted of the shipment, there's maritime default and bankruptcy, and of course the stranded of seafarers. So all these in nutshell has affected our moving forward. Next slide, please. That was a COVID story, and I could say it has uh, the, moving forward, we want to come and uh, revamp even higher. And we can revamp higher when we see the same ocean, the same healthy ecosystem that's supporting us. And are moving forward, the country is committed to re restoring the degraded system, of the coastal and marine system, supporting fishery sector, supporting our tourism, and that we hope that we'll be able to overcome the stress of the COVID with moving forward. Next slide, and I think that's my last slide. Thank you so much. I wish to thank uh, Dr. Cairo for his uh, presentation and uh, also take this opportunity to welcome the strong commitment and continued contribution of the government of Kenya to harnessing sustainable blue economy and its strong support to the achievement of SDG 14 as the co-host of the second UN Ocean Conference to be held in Lisbon, Portugal next year. We are now entering uh, the question and answers uh, segment uh, of uh, this webinar. And I have a range of questions uh, in front of me sub submitted to us by participants from around the world. We have uh, about uh, 15, 20 minutes for this segment. So I ask all the panelists to keep their answers brief uh, to about two, three minutes each. Um, there should be uh, time, some time to pose at least uh, one question to each panelist uh, and hopefully allow some interactive discussion among uh, panelists. Our first question is addressed directly to uh, Dr. Vieiras. Um, and the question is, uh, how can we ensure that efforts to achieve SDG uh, target 14.C support the development uh, of a sustainable ocean-based economy? Uh, before giving the floor to Dr. Veras, uh, now, for those uh, who do not know uh, the 2030 agenda by heart, uh, let me quote um, uh, SDG uh, target 14.C. Enhance the conservation and sustainable use of oceans and their resources by implementing international law as reflected in the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea which provides uh, the legal framework for the conservation and sustainable use of oceans and their resources, as recalled in uh, paragraph uh, 158 of the future we want. Uh, end of quote. Um, Dr. Vieiras, over to you. Thank you very much for that uh, very interesting question. And uh, 
I have to say, while I'm not a lawyer or, or an UNCLOX expert, um, 14C uh, UNCLOS and other related international law really provides a framework for the implementation of a sustainable ocean-based economy. Uh, it provides both the rights and obligations that countries have regarding ocean use. So while states have the right to exploit their national resources, those rights, uh, rights must also be exercised in accordance with their duty to protect and preserve the marine environment. Um, UNCLOS also has provisions on marine scientific research, including sharing resource research results, as well as capacity building and technology transfer. So if you look at all of these provisions together, UNCLOS underpins the implementation of a sustainable ocean-based economy. And um, in addition, I know there's been a lot of work done in the context of UNCLOS on intersectoral collaboration, for example, between regional seas and regional fisheries organizations, marine spatial planning, and uh, marine protected areas. And all of these are, again, vital components of uh, blue economies. Thank you. You're muted, Alex. Sorry about that. Uh, uh, thank you uh, very much, uh, Dr. Vieiras, uh, for your response. Uh, and the next question uh, is uh, to, uh, to Dr. Cairo. Um, how can uh, we ensure that efforts to achieve as the, uh, sorry, um, we have answered that question. Um, so the question to uh, Dr. James Cairo, uh, is what does sustainability imply vis-a-vis -vis growth uh, of uh, aquaculture? Over to you, sir. Yes. Uh, thank you so much for that question. Aquaculture can be a solution and can be a problem, depending on how you want to look at it. Aquaculture that ignore the value of healthy ecosystem that is a problem, and this one has happened a lot in the Southeast Asia, uh, where mangrove area have been converted for pond aquaculture, and in five years, those systems fail. So the approach we have is integrating aquaculture with the natural system, and this can be done when you look at the ecological footprint of aquaculture. Aquaculture, sustainable aquaculture will depend on healthy water, will depend on the healthy forest, mangrove forest, will depend on healthy seas because of the absorption of nutrients. So the concept of sustainable aquaculture is entrenched with uh, all the concept of sustainable fisheries. And it, it looks at the ecosystem, it looks at the economy, and it looks at the people and its sustainability for the future. Thank you. I thank Dr. Cairo uh, for his response. And let me now ask uh, Dr. Kirsty Nash, how can countries recover sustainably uh, from the pandemic and tackle uh, their most pressing economic concerns, especially those that depend on tourism? Over to you, Dr. Nash. I like how you're asking small questions here. Um, so I, I think that um, a key thing is, is uh, as I was talking about in, my, in our voluntary commitment, is sharing information among um, different people, different doing that transdisciplinary approaches where you're um, bringing in the perspectives and the needs and the values of various different people within your community. Um, and uh, for example, you know, re redeveloping tourism that um, is possible post COVID, but also um, fits in with the needs and the, the values of the local people, not necessarily just rebuilding tourism that we had previously, um, because that isn't always necessarily um, going to be the most sustainable uh, and the best outcome. So I think COVID, for all its you know, horrible outcomes, potentially gives us an opportunity to recreate. Um, 
tourism within the blue economy in a way that is more sustainable and is more equitable. And I think that we need to um, bring together um, people from different sectors and communities to try and create that and create a vision for tourism that, um, uh, yeah, is, is more equitable and, and really shares the, the benefits of tourism. Thank you, Dr. Nash, for your concise response to uh, what you call the small question. Uh, no questions are small uh, and we don't uh, choose it. Of course, I am selective uh, in choosing the questions we have received, uh, but uh, we did our best to select the most relevant ones. Uh, our next question uh, goes to Ms. Marie uh, Burrell McKinnon. What are some sustainable attempts uh, to stop the practice of dumping hazardous waste into the ocean? Are there any best practices that can be shared? Over to you, Marie. Uh, thank you, Chair. And uh, it's, a, it's a difficult question because uh, deep sea bed mining is not necessarily uh, associated with uh, dumping. However, there are some uh, national uh, practices where this is happening. And uh, as far as I can tell, there are, at, as we speak, there are already some scientific groups, including GESAMP. Uh, that uh, are looking into that uh, in a very close coordination with the national authorities in order to make sure that uh, this can be addressed in the in the best way and that best practice learned from science can inform uh, a way of dealing with this kind of uh, situation. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Borrell uh, McKinnon, for your uh, response. Uh, all the panelists will have an opportunity to briefly add uh, to uh, the responses from our distinguished panelists uh, to any question uh, they uh, may wish to choose. Um, but for now, our next responder is Mr. Francis uh, Munieki uh, of Card Creations. And the question is, uh, how can we achieve a sustainable blue economy while respecting human rights and humanity uh, and humanly treating uh, flora and fauna. Wow, you remember my software to disable developer. But yes, I, I just from what I think I know, we, we can be able to manage and grow a sustainable blue economy and both conserve and preserve human rights, human dignity and human rights. Um, I am assuming this is with regards to the coastal communities and what their rights, especially as a community and how they can participate both in the development and in uh, fisheries management without necessarily stopping uh, going about their way of life. I think through innovation technology and a lot of uh, information or community empowerment, we would be able to achieve both a sustainable blue economy and still keep human dignity and human rights. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Munieki. And uh, the last question uh, is for Dr. Alasdair Harris. Uh, when discussing a sustainable blue economy, uh, do we consider seas, rivers, and lakes, or is it only the ocean? How can countries manage the complexities of such diverse environments and ecosystems when considering sustainable blue economy? Over to you, uh, uh, Dr. Harris. Thanks very much. Um, that's a challenging one to answer. I think general, general definitions of, of, of the blue economy, the sustainable blue economy, which is still a relatively new concept, have been taken to relate purely to the marine environment. Um, and that's largely because it has been so neglected in the discourse around um, sustainable development and community empowerment and economic development in general. Um, so I think the answer to that, sadly, is currently it's not uh, freshwater ecosystems are not included in certainly in, in, in the, the context and the jurisdictions in which I'm working. Um, I think your second, the second part of your question is that how do we ensure the inclusion of 
blue economy considerations within countries broader planning and commitments is an incredibly pertinent one for example how do we ensure that blue carbon is integrated within countries ndcs in the run-up to the glasgow cop something that is often uh, an oversight and hasn't yet been included um, so the, the the importance of joined up thinking between um, the current excitement that's taking place in the ocean environment with more existing systems for accounting um, and, for example, greenhouse gas emissions commitments, uh, reduction commitments is, 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 is incredibly paramount. Uh, thank you, Dr. H uh, Harris. We have just a few minutes left for this segment and I invite all participants for their final comments uh, of no more than one minute each on any of the issues raised uh, in our deliberations. Um, all other participants are invited to post their comments in the chat box. So this is voluntary. Uh, so please um, open your videos and raise your hands or um, use the chat box so that I know if, yes, uh, Dr. Harris, please go on. Thanks very much. Well, I th I'd like to have a go at answering the, the penultimate question about how do we recognize the and prioritize human rights in the blue economy discourse. I think it's fair to say that the largest group of ocean users, by far the largest group of ocean users, traditional fishers, coastal fishers, small scale fishers, have um, generally been somewhat marginalized from blue economy considerations. And they have uh, the most at stake, many of them living on the front lines of accelerating climate breakdown. There are huge issues of climate justice um, and environmental justice that need to be taken into consideration within blue economy discussions, ensuring that coastal communities have adequate rights to feed themselves, to survive in the face of a rapidly changing ocean environment, and that they are not marginalized by some of these more, uh, these newer uh, economic developments within the coastal space. Perhaps the most um, compelling example of that being the interplay between growing demand for, from distant water industrial fishing fleets um, that are now interacting increasingly within traditional fishing grounds of small scale fishers who often have very little alternative. In countries like Madagascar, where famine is currently being declared as a result of climate change and chronic food insecurity, more and more people are becoming reliant on ocean resources for survival. Their interests have to be prioritized within the sustainable blue economy. Um. Thank you, Dr. Harris. Uh, now uh, uh, I can uh, see uh, uh, Dr. Cairo. Uh, yes. Uh, you, thank, you. thank you so much. And a uh, follow up to Harris' uh, comment. I think what is very important is to promote ocean literacy. People seem not to appreciate what the ocean can offer. And we have learned so much during the COVID. And the, the, the pandemic really provides a unique opportunity to build back better and do by protecting the coastal ecosystem and coastal communities. Because when we look at the intricacy, the, the, the network between the people and the coastal resources, you can easily see that communities within the coast who are depending on the marine resources did not suffer as much as those people who are away from the coastal area. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Cairo. Are there any other volunteers to take the floor for a final comment? I don't see any. Uh, so uh, I would like to thank our distinguished panelists, uh, panelists uh, for this rich and insightful discussion and for their presentation, uh, presentations on their voluntary uh, commitments. Uh, as we move to the closing of our meeting, I wish to announce that this webinar marks the launch uh, of a new DESA publication uh, titled uh, Promotion and Strengthening on um, uh, and Strengthening of Sustainable Ocean-Based Economies. Uh, the web version of the publication will be available uh, on UNDESA website, uh, and we will share the link 
to the publication also via social media. Um, once the report is uh, uploaded uh, on the website, hopefully uh, either by the end of the day today or uh, by tomorrow. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, the publication uh, was made possible uh, by a generous grant uh, from the government of Sweden uh, to UNDESA. And we are delighted to have with us today uh, Her Excellency uh, Ms. Charlotta uh, Schleiter, uh, Ambassador for Sustainable Development at the Permanent Mission of Sweden uh, to the United Nations. And I now have the pleasure to invite Ambassador uh, Schleiter to deliver her remarks. Over to you, Ambassador. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for this, uh, to organ for organizing this and, and for this opportunity to listen to, uh, to the presentations and, and panel discussions today. I think each of the panelists have given an excellent example of ways in which we can take on our commitments to our oceans. Uh, and in fact, there are ways and means to move towards SDG 14 and, and sustainable blue economies. And, and I think these examples will inspire interest in how this can be done. And I hope, of course, even more voluntary commitments. In 2017, Sweden and, and Fiji hosted the first UN conference uh, on the ocean in New York. And it was in many ways a, a powerful wake up call to all of us uh, on the state of the oceans. But it also showed us the vast amount of, of expertise and, and, and willingness uh, available. And, and it's, it's great to see the commitments and, and partnerships that were formed in 2017 moving forward and, and showcased in, in the report that was launched here today. So this report highlights good examples and, and progress uh, made, but also points towards the need for a robust framework to support the development of blue economy and help secure that it's socially and environmentally sustainable. And I think we've gotten lots of uh, examples um, to, uh, to unpack those uh, today. Not only is minimizing environmental pressures necessary for, for human welfare, but, but it's also good for business to create solutions for future demand and to avoid stranded assets being built into uh, ships infrastructure and business models. So as we're ready for the second UN Ocean Conference in Lisbon hosted by Kenya and Portugal, uh, we should step up our efforts to agree internationally on science-based definitions, principles and guidelines that can then steer ODA um, and other finance and investments as well as systems to monitor and, and evaluate the growth of the blue economy. And again, we'd like to see more voluntary commitments uh, before uh, this conference. I hope some can be born from the ideas provided here today. So good work has been done regarding ocean related sustainable finance, sustainable finance principles for the blue economy um, has now been further um, developed by UNEP finance initiative and that's one example. The EU directive on sustainable finance is another with a delegated act, uh, um, dedicated act regarding the ocean in the pipeline. It's intended to increase investments in sustainable activities and make investments that come with high environmental impacts more difficult. Aligning the flow of funds for investments with our climate and, and, and uh, environment and social goals is, is vital to reach them. This transition obviously has to be done while securing our economic competitiveness, but it's also a prerequisite for making competitiveness uh, uh, last. And, and obviously, um, references have been made to all the opportunities ahead, the Oceans Conference, uh, COP, uh, et cetera, for, for um, discussing these issues more broadly. And I'd like also to mention in this context, uh, the preparations for a meeting Stockholm Plus 50, uh, which uh, we are preparing for in collaboration with Kenya, uh, and which will take place then in June, 2022 and marks 50 years since the first environmental conference in Stockholm. 
So the pandemic is not over, far from it, but we have already learned important lessons from it. Uh, let's use uh, this moment to rebuild in a way which is both greener and bluer. This report should help us. Uh, we can do it, but only if we work together. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador, for your important statement and your continued support. And before concluding the meeting, uh, I invite everyone uh, to watch a video message from Ambassador Peter Thompson, uh, the Secretary General Special Envoy for the Ocean. Uh, please play the video. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, all courtesies observed, and warm greetings to all present. I'm very grateful to you, Andessa, for organizing this webinar for the Community of Ocean Action for the Sustainable Blue Economy, and for giving me the opportunity of delivering these closing remarks. I'd also like to express my deep appreciation to the speakers and panelists of today's event for their valuable insights and the good guidance they've given us all on the work ahead. We know that the COVID-19 pandemic hit the ocean-based economy hard, bringing global tourism to a standstill, leaving seafarers stranded at sea and plunging hundreds of thousands of small fishermen into poverty. And it's now well understood that as we emerge from the pandemic, we must, as the saying goes, feel back better, with that victim logically driving us towards a blue-green recovery that resets our relationship with the planet to one of respect and balance. Although they were not designed for post-pandemic scenarios, insofar as our relationship with the ocean is concerned, the targets of Sustainable Development Goal 14 give us a blueprint for a blue-green recovery. And although it's not explicably stated as such, when you get down to it, at the heart of the Sustainable Development Goal 14 is the sustainable blue economy. I emphasize the word sustainable. And in doing so, my mind goes back to the great progress we made on this score at the Sustainable Blue Economy Conference in Nairobi in 2018. I said then, and have done so many times since, that my heart's just not in it if the development of the blue economy stands for doubling down on linear exploitation of finite planetary resources. But if we're speaking about the sustainable blue economy, then that is another matter altogether, from nutrition to medicine, from coastal resilience to green ports, from renewable energy to carbon sequestration and pollution-free transportation. Sustainable blue economy will provide the foundations upon which a secure future for humanity can be built. It offers massive potential for increasing economic benefits and job opportunities for coastal states, especially small island developing states and coastal African states. Sectors such as fisheries, aquaculture, and tourism support the livelihoods of millions of people and are key to poverty eradication, food security, and gender inclusion. Noting that about that uh, women currently constitute about 50% of the labor force in small-scale fisheries. These sectors and other ocean-related economic activities will give us the bright future we seek for our children and grandchildren, but only if we rule these activities under the principle of sustainability. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to commend the work of the co-focal points and members of this community of ocean action for the sustainable blue economy. It has been heartening to hear from the voluntary commitment holders that initiatives and projects to promote the sustainable blue economy have been implemented and many are already yielding positive results at national and local level. Your community of ocean action and its eight sister communities have faithfully shepherded the 1600 voluntary commitments made at and since the UN Ocean Conference in 2017. Registry of voluntary commitments carefully maintained by DESA remains open, and we expect a surge in new voluntary commitments to be made in support of SDG 14 as we approach the second UN Ocean Conference. Today, I call upon all stakeholders from government to private sector, from civil society to the scientific community, 
to bolster the communities of ocean action by registering new voluntary commitments. By doing so, they will become integral to the generation of the solutions we seek to, to deliver on the conservation and sustainable use of the ocean's resources. Ladies and gentlemen, for the ocean to deliver the blue-green recovery the world so urgently requires, finance at a hitherto unprecedented scale must flow into the sustainable rural economy. The UNFCCC's COP26 will be held in Glasgow this November, and I urge all involved to lend their voices, efforts, and influence to moving the climate finance needle decisively in the direction of the sustainable blue economy. While I have this opportunity, I'd also like to reinforce the importance of the sustainable blue economy finance principle, drawn up by WWF, the European Investment Bank, and others. You can find the principles on the UNEP FI website. And to illustrate their great worth to us all, I choose this extract from their charter. We, the organizations that have agreed to adopt these principles, believe that delivering on them will contribute to the conservation and sustainable use of the ocean and to de risking investment in the sustainable blue economy. I appeal to you all to spread the word on the sustainable blue economy finance principle. Your thinking. On an emerging relationship with the ocean is ruled by sustainability, though as far as I'm concerned, this community of ocean action will clear the passages safely and will find its way to the havens we seek. I wish you all fair winds. If you're lucky, you'll have smooth seas, but when the latter is not the case, recall the words of Franklin D. Roosevelt, who once said, smooth seas never made a skilled sailor. This is the time for us all to adjust our rigging, to take stock, to freshen up our thinking and action, Will, will not be long before we make landfall in Lisbon. A year's time will be gathered there at the second great UN Ocean Conference. Under the leadership of Portugal and Kenya, we have a mandated responsibility in Lisbon to scale up ocean action based on science, innovation, stock taking, and partnerships. Use the solutions that set us on course for safe delivery of our SDG 14 targets by 2030. I thank you for your attention. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, we have just uh, heard the inspiring uh, video message from Ambassador Peter Thompson, the UN Secretary General's uh, Special Envoy for the Ocean. In concluding, uh, I wish to thank once again our speakers, distinguished panelists, and all participants uh, for joining us today. Uh, as Ambassador Thompson said, we look forward to seeing you at our uh, future events in the lead up to the second UN Ocean Conference in Lisbon next year. Thank you all, and this meeting is now adjourned. Thank you. Bye.